Hello students, welcome to Legacy IS Academy. In today's video, we are going to discuss about deep sea mining, mining of deep sea metals and whether it can be considered as a vital resource for the economic development or it is going to become an environmental disaster in the future. So basically, there is a two kind of view that is being built up around this deep sea mining. One that promotes it because of the extreme advantages that you will have in the sense of economic development by extracting these minerals and on the other hand some environmentalists are opposing it because it will have a catastrophic effect on the deep sea marine ecosystem as well. So it is in this context let us try to understand what is the deep sea metals and deep sea mining and what are the issues around it. So first of all to give you the context in which we are discussing this topic right now is because recently you have an organization called as International Seabed Authority headquartered in Jamaica, the capital city of Jamaica that is Kingston and recently it is the 29th session of the International Seabed Authority is actually being held here. So the ocean floor basically we're talking about or talk about holds a vast reserve of what we can call as the metal ores as well as the rare earth metal ores but mining these valuable resources could permanently damage the fragile marine ecosystem that exists at such a greater depth. When you talk about such a greater depth, we are talking about depth of almost 5 to 6 kilometers from the sea surface. So representatives from all over the world have spent most of the last month in Jamaica negotiating the future of the deep sea mining. The headquarter of ISA is based on Jamaica as we have discussed before and it is the ISA which regulates and grants right to explore or extract these minerals and that is why whatever happens in the meeting of this organization become very very important in the uh, from the perspective of deep sea mining. So if you talk about the deep sea mining what is the present or current status of mining. So as per the bulletin published by the IESA it has said that by the next year that is in 2025 it is going to define a set of legally binding rules. Why legally binding rule? Because IESA basically works under the convention basically referred as UN clause which means United Nations Convention on Law of the Seas. So it wants to define a set of legally binding rules to manage the deep sea mining because without these rules any planned mining operation will not be able to get started. So in this context we can take example of two group of countries. On one side we have Germany, Brazil and Palau which is a central Pacific Ocean country. So they have said that they would not agree on the new rules until their environmental impact, environmental impact of DC mining, deep ocean mining has been fully investigated, thoroughly investigated. On the other hand, we have some countries such as China, Norway, Japan and Nauru. They have said that they, were, they would prefer a quick agreement about these rules so that mining companies can start putting their plans into action and mining can be started as soon as possible, as quickly as possible depending on the technological feasibility for that. So if you talk about the present status, the company that is largely uh, spearheading the deep sea mining is called as the metals company. Metals company is basically a Canadian company and of the we talk about the Canadian startup metals company, it already has announced its plan to submit an application to ISA for the commercial deep sea mining operation in the coming month. At the same time of the 169 countries which are represented in the international seabed authorities, 32 are now only in favor of suspending or even banning deep sea mining outright because these countries are largely highlighting the environmental impact and more precisely the adverse environmental adverse ecological impact a stance that is supported by environmental organizations and many marine scientists as well. Now what are the these concerns about the environment that we are going to discuss in the later part of the video. So before coming to the environmental concern let us try to understand why so many countries especially countries such as China, Japan, Norway even India they want to extract and explore the deep ocean resources what actually are present at the deep ocean bed. So the most important resource that you can find at these greater depth are what we call as PMN that is stand for polymetallic nodules which look something like this. So basically these polymetallic nodules consist lot of metals in a single rock structure 
and these are found outside the territorial waters of the country. That is why ISA has to get involved and grant the exploration and extraction right. So most of these resources are also found in the high seas. High seas are basically an example of global commons where no country can claim exclusive right in the especially in the economic sphere. So if you talk about the oceans of the world, more than half of world's ocean actually are made up of high sea or consists of high sea and that is why you need to have a UN led organization to manage the resources here. Second, whatever resources that is being extracted from the high sea areas, even including the PMNs, UN and the IS said it should be considered as a common heritage of mankind. That means these resources should not belong to any particular nation. The only one nation or few nations should not reap the benefit or economic benefit out of these resources. Rather, the benefit should be shared with the entire humanity or in that manner we can say with all the countries. Second, as we have discussed already before, these regulation of these areas are done under the laws of Convention of Seas signed in 1982. So many countries and corporations are interested in the commercial potential of the deep sea mine. Now let us try to understand slightly in more detail about the profits that these companies and countries can make. So as far as the deep sea mining is concerned, as of now, the ISA has given 31 exploration licenses. Now keep in mind this is just exploration license, it is still not exploitation license that means the countries cannot still extract and utilize these resources for certain areas and out of these 31 exploration licenses, 5 have gone to the Chinese companies. Now several other countries including Germany, India and Russia have also been exploring the seabed areas. As far as India is concerned, the deep sea region which India is exploring lies in what we can call as the Central Indian Ocean Basin which lies close to the exclusive economic zone of Mauritius. Now UNC convention we talk about clearly state that any activity that takes place in the high sea areas that is global common areas must be equitably shared among the states and that would include profits from deep sea mining also. To give an example, let us suppose India has been granted the exploration licenses for the exclusive economic zone area that lies on in the Mauritius. So if India in future is able to extract metals from here or ore from here, then India should share the benefit not only to its people but also to the people of the Mauritius and the other surrounding countries. That is the general principle and theme of the UNC convention. So when you're talking about the distribution of PMNs, this is the map, world map on which we can understand how the resources are distributed. Now, as we have discussed, the most important resources is the PMN that is polymetallic nodules. So though polymetallic nodules you can see on this map are spread over many regions of the ocean, there are certain regions where the economic, uh, this we can say the viability of economic extraction is quite high. And two such regions that has been identified, first is around Indian Ocean that we have discussed, the central Indian Ocean Basin and the second region which many countries have their eye on is in the central Pacific Ocean which is referred as Clarion Clipperton Zone. So Clarion Clipperton Zone, Central Indian Ocean Basin, well known for their PMNs, polyamide metallic nodules. Similarly, if you look at the yellow shaded region on the world map here, largely in the oceans of the world, these regions are rich in the cobalt which again is a very important minerals and metal. Then we have some areas which is having sulphide wind from where you can get the sulphur and these are lying largely around the zones where volcanic eruption happens. That means another way we can say these are largely lying around the mid-oceanic ridges of the world. So that is how we can understand the overall distribution of the minerals that we are talking about. However, as we have discussed, the most significant mineral is PMN. So PMN, as we have discussed, it refers to polymetric nodules. It is not a very large size rock structure. Largely, most of these rocks are in the size of potato. So potato size lumps that is formed over a time of million of years uh, of the sediment deposits that has happened over the ocean bottom. Now, polymetric nodules largely consist of four main metals. The first is manganese that comprises almost 29%. Then second we have is nickel that comprises 1.3%, then we have copper that is 1.1% and then we have cobalt that is 0.2% and then remaining are lot of other metals which are found here. 
so that is why since the manganese contribution or const uh, this we can say manganese concentration is highest in this pmns sometimes these pmns are also referred as manganese nodules so what is the significance if you are able to extract these nodules from deep sea bottom now first of all obviously as we know the entire world due to the impact of the fossil fuels on the climate change is trying to shift to the cleaner or greener energy resources so as we transition to renewable energy uh, international energy association energy agency has estimated that the demand for these metal will double by 2040 and these demand cannot solely be met by extracting these minerals from the continental crust and as these minerals are very really, very really vital component key component in electric car, car batteries that is why we are making this estimation so extraction from a depth of between 4 to 6 kilometers deep below the ocean with automated vacuum robots bringing them to the surface with hoses this is how largely the countries are expecting to extract and reap the benefit of these minerals and the metals so polymetallic sulfides on the other hand talk about they also have many other minerals in a light concentration such as copper, zinc, lead, iron, silver and even gold and cobalt rich ferromanganese crust which are especially hard to break up and recover from the ocean depth. That is how we can understand the three major mineral zones lying at the deeper part of the ocean. Now we have discussed in the beginning of the video that largely the opposition to such missions the deep sea mining, deep ocean mining is coming from the environmentalists and the countries who are also taking a stance to protect and preserve the ecosystem. So what is the effect that these minings can have on the marine ecosystem? Let us try to understand this. So as we know that the manganese nodules, so the PMNs as we have called before and mineral crust, they are not dead rocks because they are making the bed of the ocean and that is why they are an important habitat for many sea creatures for which these areas are home. So, more than 5,000 different species, some of which have barely been researched, make these unhospitable, uh, unhospitable areas their home. So, obviously, logic says that if you try to disturb, extract, explore these areas, the habitat of these different, different species of marine life will obviously be negatively impacted. Then, we are talking about these species. They are not similar to the species that we find in other parts of the oceans. Because these species of animal, they survive in extreme of conditions because at a deeper part of the region, uh, ocean, deeper region of the ocean, we have scarce food resources, we have non-existent sunlight, it is a dark or we can say permanently dark region of the ocean, they have very high water pressure, hydrostatic pressure. So in such extreme condition, the seabed ecosystem that exists and species that have adapted to living in these conditions are extremely fragile and extremely rare that means if this region is disturbed we might risk losing all these species altogether and they can they will never be able to survive they'll never be able to migrate to some other area so the permanent extinction is something that is a real possibility here not only that as we have discussed the mining largely will be done by a robotic structure which we can call as mining robots and mining robots will use the vacuuming technology which will expand their area in the search for the magazine nodules and obviously as they destroy and disrupt the entire ocean bed it would destroy the ocean floor and suck up countless sea creature which obviously will die due to the movement of these robots then obviously as the mining progresses and more and more countries and companies joins this uh, venture there would be a huge light and noise pollution in the region of the ocean where light is non-existent where noise is non-existent so it will have a far-reaching impact and especially we call the swirling cloud of sediment that these all missions will create in these areas third we can see the fishing activity it will be permanently disrupted above the mining areas because the mining will not only really disturb the deep sea ecosystem but also the entire region of the ocean where this uh, phenomena is being conducted so obviously the fishes from the surface and the subsurface level also will migrate or if they get trapped they will also die. So beginning of deep sea mining many marine ecologists many marine scientists have this view that beginning any kind of deep sea mining without sufficient knowledge of its potential consequences impact could be catastrophic for biodiversity as an as uh, yet little known sea ecosystem existing here. So basically they are saying 
that it's not that we should clearly clear cut ban the mining we should not uh, talk about this think about this work around it but rather we should also have a clear study about what can be the potential consequences and how can we adjust and tackle these consequences so if we talk about when we can expect the mining because it is still all the countries and companies that we have talked about interested in this are in the exploration phase still so in this context the metals company the canadian startup that we have talked about it has planned to start operation in the clarion clipperton zone if you remember we have discussed this is a large zone of polymetric nodules lying in the central pacific ocean so they have said that by 2026 they are planning to start the operations however again they have to first submit their proposal to the isa for approval and obviously their operations will depend upon when and if isa provide this approval. second country in this regard is norway so in norway you have an island that is svalbard island so norway aims to start its own mining operation as soon as possible in the north atlantic region between greenland and the svalbard archipelago so country want to start granting licenses to exploration next year with mining operations planned for year 2030 so these are the Uh, ex expectation that is uh, that is uh, that is going to start and that is where uh, mining operations in the deep sea areas can start now what about india so india also has been given the exploration license as you discussed in central indian ocean so they already have launched a program in 2021 that is called as samudrayaan samudrayaan is going to be india's first manned ocean mission and this is something that has been launched under the aegis of ministry of earth sciences now as far as the samudrayaan is concerned it has a lot of objectives one objective being that it want to develop a 6000 crore deep ocean mission that will send submarines with three persons to a depth of about 6000 meter and in this regard already india is constructing a, this submersible vehicle that has been named as matasya 6000 so this is the structure that you are seeing here this is the submarine or submersible vehicle which will take the people Three people or three persons to a depth of six thousand meters in the ocean. Also, the other objective of this program is to enable exploration of ocean resources, largely for drinking water, clean energy, and blue economy. And the last provision, the last feature, is that it will make deep sea mining and exploration a reality by twenty twenty two. However, this deadline has been missed, but still, the work under the Samudrayaan mission is already. going on so maybe in next decade we will be able to actually utilize and extract the minerals from the central indian ocean basin obviously subjected to the approval and development of the isa in this regard so that is all about this particular video i hope you understood about what is deep ocean mining where uh, where india stands in this context and how future development is expected to take place thank you very much